Yes, absolutely. I mean, do we do we need to insult our audience by uh, present, you know, introducing Kevin, or are we going to assume that if you don't know who Kevin is, you really don't belong here anyway? What? What? <laughs> uh, <you know. laughs> yeah, that I mean, sounds like. Why don't we just start with Robert's question? Yeah, let's get straight straight in. Um, I think you saw this one, Kevin, and because you commented that you thought it was a pretty a pretty good question. Anyway, forgive me for looking down at my phone uh, just to make sure I read it uh, verbatim. Uh, Robert Isaacs, a you know, friend and colleague of all of ours, given how our understanding of biomechanics has evolved over the last 16 years, is there anything in your seminal 2001 paper which you would change, add or remove if you were to write it today? Well, first of all, I'd like to you know, thank Craig and Ian for inviting me to be on their pod chat live. This is, a, I think, a great idea. You know, specifically in response to Robert's uh, question, when I did that, uh, paper back, I guess, 2001. Um, it was a part of uh, some of the things I was working on at the time, and I thought that this was, I had enough information to put together a pretty nice paper and with a lot of theory and explaining some clinical observations. Um, I don't think I would change any of the theory part of it. Uh, I, I think, though, my it would be nice to be able to do add to it uh, rather the rotation of subtalar joint axis location and rotational equilibrium theory is a nice start, but it obviously doesn't explain everything clinically we see. And um, there's been a lot of new evidence. Uh, I've just wrote a newsletter on Luke Kelly's research on plantar intrinsic function. Um, and there's a lot of good research that's happened that I think could add to it. I don't think anything, I would change uh, as far as a major change of the paper, but it'd be more an addition to, uh, to uh, and further on add more to the paper to explain other clinical observations we see. Um, off, the, off the back of that, and it's probably a question that someone else asked, and I can't remember who, I'm just looking down at my phone to because they came in from about four or five different pages I, I, I may I may be missing some but someone meant someone asked me it may have even been a private message if you've got any plans um I know you're always publishing writing you know your your newsletters and writing for production but any plans for any more sort of formal publications from you in, in the future any more you know have you got any more uh any more big papers left in your locker that you're going to release before you uh one day if you ever decide to retire well, I, yeah, that's a, right now, uh, practice is busy, you know, I'm still have a full practice. Um, you know, I'm going after this back to the office and see probably 15 patients this Thursday afternoon here. Um, so a lot of the writing I'm doing now is being done for podiatry today, podiatry management, uh, podiatry today. I'll be, we'll be talking a little bit about mid tarsal joint, an article, uh, the papers in JAMA, probably not anything in plans right now just because I'm so busy with other writing and lecturing um, doing a lot of international lecturing as you all know so um, and the problem with trying to get anything published in a peer reviewed journal like that I'm sometimes <coughs> year, waiting a year for the publication to come through so after it gets reviewed and such so I'm I don't nothing in the plans I, I if I wasn't working so much to earn a living and uh, that sort of thing, I'd probably be spending more time doing more writing for the journal and such. But um, yeah, there's only so much you can do in a, one lifetime, I guess. Yeah. Um, just to follow up to, to Robert's first question about what you would change about that seminal paper, I, I know I look back at some of my earliest publications and almost want to disown them. Um, and I, I do have a bit of fun going back, looking at, say, some of my biomechanics boot camps that, uh, PowerPoints from 15 years ago, and I think, oh my God, did I really say that? So I just, just sort of following up, you know, what bits might you change if you had the chance to do it again? Because I, I know there's a lot I would like to change in some of the stuff I did, but you, you move with the evidence over time. Well, I think the I think the biggest um, when I look back at the writing I've done over the past 30 years, I, I think the mid tarsal joint thing has been the biggest thing that. Um, Chris Nestor's work and on the mid tarsal joint, I think has been the biggest change because I look at back my early newsletters where I'm talking about the longitudinal axis and the <laughs> oblique axis and 
you know, and it was right. And Chris Nestor comes up with his research. And I said, like, wow, you know, it's this, you know, I, I was so wrong. And of course I was just repeating what I was taught back in podiatry school by, you know, John Weed and Ron Balmassi and such. And uh, then when he came out with his paper, I think that said, well, you know, I really had to say, okay, this makes a lot more sense. Uh, it's, it's the axis is determined by the motion, not the axis determining the motion, et cetera, et cetera. So, I, I, and I didn't really touch on, I didn't even touch on that in that paper on subtalar joint axis uh, equilibrium. So uh, that would be something like I said before, I would want to add, I would add to that. But it's, it it's becomes uh, part of the problem when you're trying to publish in a journal like that, we're dealing with very complex topics that sometimes require just a lot of words and illustrations to explain it in a fashion that's going to be educational for people. So that's, uh, that, that's really the limiting factor is that you, you really have to be careful when you're doing any publishing, and I've published plenty, is that you don't bite off more than you can chew. Uh, you know, make the paper too long, they won't even publish it. So um, you're looking more at, you know, if there was going to do something, I've often thought if I slow down, I could sit down and do a, a textbook, more of a traditional textbook that covers um, the topics we go through, uh, biomechanics theory, um, moments, strain, stress, last modulus, internal moments, external moments, you know, with an explanation, then building on that as a clinical uh, scenario for uh, foot health practitioners and podiatrists to use that knowledge and way of thinking to better understand what they're doing with orthotics and other treatments. And that would be, to me, that would make more sense trying to do a textbook where I could have more latitude and length to cover a lot of things versus a short article. Sure. This is just on the mid tarsal joint. I, I find with increasing frequency, I, I still use the term mid tarsal joint, but I just with increasing frequency tend to say mid foot joints rather than mid tarsal joint. And I just wonder if you'd comment on that. Yeah, I, I think that that's, you know, when I was, uh, you know, biomechanics, uh, fellow and uh, biomechanics student, you know, a podiatrist student at the California College back in the late 70s and um, uh, early 80s, um, we really didn't talk about the midfoot joints, which is, um, it was all subtalar joint, mid tarsal joint, ankle joint, then the metatarsal phalanger joints. So I, I think that this midfoot, the idea that these midfoot joints play just as important roles, and certainly uh, Nestor's bone pin studies show that these midfoot joints move a lot also that I, I, yeah, I think we have to look at not just the mid tarsal joint, but the midfoot joints and, um, and the medial lateral column, uh, just how they move differently from each other and how the, uh, motions, um, of those are part of the uh, kinetics and kinematics of what happened in foot, both during or walking and running. So, um, yeah, there's so much stuff going on. And uh, I, I think the biggest thing though, that I think that I've really emphasized versus I think uh, like what Chris Ness has done is I've always tended to emphasize the kinetics, the, the motion, the more less the motion than really understanding the internal forces and external forces and the moments. And because these are what determine the pathology we see. And, uh, and so I, I think that's really been something that I've uh, focused on, been interested in, because I think that's it really, uh, it, because you can't have motion without uh, change in moments. So I, I think that that's really what interests me the most, We're looking at free body diagrams, looking at static analyses of, uh, of the foot under different loading conditions, and just trying to understand what the forces are inside the foot so we can understand the pathologies that uh, occur and how we can best treat them. Yeah. It might be a good time to pitch in with another question, actually, because uh, it kind of touches on a couple of things that you said there, Kevin. And uh, it's from someone, I think, a, a colleague of yours in the US. I'll just read. It's quite a long one. So I'm just going to read the first half, which will probably allow us to go off into two directions, potentially. Um, here's, here's the comment. Um, in surgical realignment of the hind foot, uh, the objective is realignment or optimal, optimal alignment. My question is, how do we use tissue stress theory, uh, preferred movement pathway theory in orthotic design? If these theories don't promote alignment of the foot as the orthotic objective, then how does a medially deviated subtalar joint axis get realigned using these theories? Um, so I think there's two things to, to, to consider now. And the first is obviously uh, 
the, the whole debate, if you like, about optimal alignment, um, which uh, clearly the surgeons uh, are, are able to find, uh, allegedly. And the second is obviously, as you've touched on, this, this concept of you know, what actually is a joint axis. I think it's probably worth for some of our listeners reminding them it's you know, just an artificial construct. Uh, you touched on it briefly then, but maybe going into that in a bit more detail, because clearly the, the concept of realigning an axis is, is perhaps not terminology I've, I've ever heard you or, or Craig use. Yeah, I, I think we have to be very careful when we start talking about realigning axes. That's really not the way I would describe it. I, and, you know, we could spend a whole hour just talking about joint axes and constraint, non-constraint mechanisms of the foot and such. Um, but the bottom line is, uh, for that, that I had read that question, tissue stress theory is very useful not only from treating people conservatively, but also from a surgical aspect. The differences are that with the surgical aspect, you're actually changing the internal structures of the foot to uh, optimize or uh, hopefully optimize the function of the foot and get rid of the pain. So you're doing an internal reconstruction of the foot, whether it's like cutting a bone, osteotomy, tendon lengthening, what have you. But with more traditional tissue stress theory, we tend to think of it as being a conservative option where we're uh, using orthoses, over-the-counter or custom, shoes, strengthening, stretching exercises, um, and that sort of thing to try to reduce the stress on the injured structures to improve function, uh, you know, get rid of the pathology or make the pathology better so that the patient can get back to their normal activities. <clears throat> A very different approach, though, surgically versus conservatively. I do surgery also. And so when we're doing surgery, we're trying to improve the alignment of the internal structures, uh, whether that's lengthening or making them different angle or what have you, in order to make the foot function better. But, and I think you could use, you can use tissue stress theory in the sense that, okay, let's say we have a posterior tibial tendon dysfunction and we've decided that we're gonna do surgery. If we do a displacement osteotomy, shifting the plantar aspect of the posterior calcaneus more medial so we get increased um, moment arm for ground erection force to cause the uh, a supination moment on the heel, plantar heel, and also uh, Achilles tendon force to cause more supination moment across the subtalar joint axis by shifting it more medial relative to the subtalar joint. Then you know we are using that tissue stress theory to uh, take this load off the posterior tibia tendon so it doesn't have so much, uh, not having to be used so much by the body to supinate the foot. So I, I, I read the question. I didn't really totally understand it, but I, I think the concept of tissue stress can be used both conservatively and surgically. But um, we, it is there are very different ways of doing things. One's uh, changing, altering external forces. So with the, with orthotics, we're changing the uh, plantar locations, the temporal patterns, and the magnitudes of ground reaction forces act, acting on the plantar foot during. Uh, weight bearing activities, whereas in surgery, we're, we're not so much changing ground reaction force, we're changing the internal structure of the foot so that we reduce the pathological loads that is causing the pathology or the pain for the patient. And um, I've had a text from Dr. Spooner uh, on this exact topic actually just come through. Question, question for you. It's, uh, given that joint axes are artificial kinematic constructs and as such they only exist when a joint is in motion, how can we employ a static weight bearing assessment of subtalar joint axial position a la uh, you, um, the constrained versus non-constrained joints argument notwithstanding? Yeah, that's a good question. I'd, uh, how are you doing, Simon? I appreciate you uh, asking yes, a good question like that. Uh, yeah. <coughs> So I think for the subtalar joint axis, we're we're pretty safe to assume that this this axis, uh, this subtalar joint has a high enough constraint with the tight interosseous ligaments and cervical ligaments between the talus and calcaneus. We can we can kind of predict even in the static position where it's going to be as we start to move it. Of course, in movement, we don't know where their axis is until it starts moving. But unless it's a you know uh, some sort of traumatic force obliquely, you know, like a car accident or like a really high impact side cutting force, 
I think that a normal weight bearing where we're standing, uh, walking, and uh, doing normal running activities, the subtalar joint axis is going to probably be within a fairly um, uh, narrow range of bundle of axes, and the bundle of axes is kind of first used by von Langlam in his 1983 thesis. Um, so, but I think for things like the mid-tarsal joint, where you have a loosely constrained axis, where really how the force is coming through the foot, whether it's external and the internal force is resisting it, that's going to really uh, affect the joint axis locations uh, and directions. And, and this has, you know, been shown by, not only by uh, Nestor, but also Van Langlan and uh, Svensson. And so the ones that have done the uh, bone pin studies or uh, the metallic bead studies in the cadaver or uh, live feet. So, I think that's the next step forward for us understanding joint axes is to talk about this idea of constraint and non-constraint mechanisms. Uh, Anthony Husson had been one of the first to really discuss that, and I, I actually did discuss that in my 2001 paper on subtalar joint axis location and rotation of equilibrium. Uh, so that's that's something that I think we um, need to understand so that the joint axes are not set in space but there are some joints that have a tighter bundle of axes such as subtalar joint and some have a more loose bundle such as the mid-tarsal joint he like he, he he likes that answer he's just texting me saying good answer so you, you've you've appeased him for now at least yeah, um, well, it was a pig son <laughs> just for now uh another question if is it just okay just to plow on craig i know no, kevin short yep yeah. yeah, right um this is a bit of a rhetorical question and it, and it sort of uh, touches on, I guess we don't want to get too much into the kind of root debate, you know, the kind of, and, and even today on Podiatry Arena, there was a discussion about does root theory. Oh, need come on, let's go at it. I am. You want to, you want to, you want to go there? Okay, let's go there. So <laughs> this is, this controversy. is a, people want controversy. I don't know that it's that controversial, but this is genuine. This is a question that isn't meant with any disrespect to, to the, those, those group of your colleagues and, and, and previous professors at, at California College of Podiatry Medicine. But let's assume every single podiatrist on the planet, as of now, got completely exterminated and we had to start from scratch. So there was no, there was no baggage, there was no, no, one, no one had a dog in any fight. Do you think if we just took the next batch of podiatrists and we taught them an anatomy, physics, physics slash engineering, material science, so how different materials respond to external load. Um, do you think if we taught pretty much those things alone and nothing else, do you think the state of podiatry would be any better, worse, or no different with respect to our ability to treat patients, our clinical outcomes? Well, that's, yeah, that's a really good question. I, you know, Simon Spooner and I actually have talked about this a little bit because when we've lectured in the countries such as Spain, and I know he lectures in Portugal quite a bit, that have relatively young podiatry professions, um, it's, it's much easier. It's, it's relatively easy to teach there because they don't have the preconceived notions that have come from the countries that learn the root theory first and then are having to now uh, relearn things because many of the uh, ideas that were taught by Root we we know are not true. So I think that yes, uh, if we were to start from scratch with um, uh, without any preconceived notions, and uh, as you said, anatomy is critical. Understanding the functions, uh, I, I think, understanding the functions of the uh, all the ligaments, tendons, muscles, and bones. And not just talk about muscle function, talk about bone function. What does this bone, what does the first metatarsal actually do for the foot? And that's the way I like to think. And I, you know, that was, you know, if I ever did it, do a textbook, that's the way I would approach. I would take every, every anatomical uh, item of the foot and lower extremity that could be injured and say, what is the function of this? What would happen if this was shorter, longer, different angle? And I, I think that's, um, and along with the physiology, like you said, the physics, which would be the biomechanics and engineering aspects. I think it would greatly improve the ability to treat. However, that being said, we've done pretty well for many years using the root theories as a basis for trying to understand many of the uh, of the ways we can treat <coughs> with our products. So uh, I, I think that in my, I was happy to be trained on, in many ways to be trained by the root and his, um, 
his colleagues in my training, but at the same time, I think it held me back in some ways also in that I was, it took me a while to feel confident enough in my observations to say, hey, you know, this doesn't make sense. Um, let's look at this subtotal axis thing. Uh, why does the calcaneus, uh, you know, if it's maximum, in other words, things, things that uh, got us as students and, and me even more as a biomechanics fellow was things like, okay, we measure the calcaneus bisection. It's maximally pronated. Their subtotal neutral position is with the calcaneus eight degrees inverted, but we're told then to balance the orthotic at the heel vertical position, which is a maximally pronated position. So that was what we were taught. And I, I remember asking Dr. John Weed, I said, well, you know, why would you, what's the purpose of measuring neutral and the maximum prone position when we're going to take this heel vertical position as the basis for our orthotic prescription for most of these patients? No matter what they had, there's still a vertically balanced orthotic with a four degree, four degree rear post with a rotor orthotic that ended to the metatarsal next. So that, when you start seeing those things as a student, but after student, at least for me, and then later on during my biomechanics fellowship, I had, I had to come up with, I just didn't feel comfortable with it. Just, it just didn't make good sense. And when I was a student and a fellow and had something that didn't make sense, I thought about it. I asked as many people as I could about their opinions. And if I didn't come up with an answer, then I had to just kind of put it on the shelf and hopefully get, get it answered later. Uh, or come up with a better idea on my own. So um, that's that's the type of problem that root theory gave us. There was a lot of stuff that was being said and taught that wasn't true. It was better than nothing in some ways, but at the same time, I think it also when you're taught like that, uh, where some things just don't make sense, it gives you an uneasiness that you're maybe not being taught uh, the truth and that you need to go out on your own and to try to find something that makes more sense. Actually, something you just said then, Kevin, uh, reminded me of Morgan's meat pie theory. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking of that. I, didn't, I wasn't going to bring that one up, but that is, uh, yeah, uh, Morgan's meat pie theory was, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you want to explain that one. or. I, I actually have a whole video on the theory in my, in my online boot camp. So, yes. Yeah, well, I think... To, Yes. I think it would be good if you explained it because Simon told me this story many years ago. I've, I've told, there's a group of physiotherapists I work with in London, physiotherapists who refer to orthoses that, as meat pies. Um, you know, in a jokey way to me, they say, I've sent you someone, can you tell me if, they, if you think they need a pair of your pies? So it's, it's language that is being used still and I think you should probably uh, explain it for those listening because otherwise it will feel like an in-joke. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I, I look I'll, I'll, briefly what it is. It doesn't matter what measurement, what clinical observation you do. Everyone gets four degrees. Um, that's the simplified <laughs> version. But what look what I'll do? I'll, I'll I'll post below in a day or two a link to the video I did on the theory, and I'll make that video live for everyone to see because I explain it in a lot more detail the, the origination of it. I, I have tried to to make contact with, and I apologise, I've forgotten his first name, the guy Morgan who came up with it, but I haven't been able to track him down. But yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll post a link to the video. I'll make the video live for everyone to see the theory because it, it is fun. <coughs> Excellent. Um, so just to, just to clarify, Kevin, can, can we quote that Kevin Kirby says we don't need root theory to be good podiatrists? Is that a quote that is that, or is that out of context? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that when we... You know, when I'm teaching to the students and the residents, really there's very little root theory I use. I think the subtelligent neutral is a useful reference. Um, don't ask me exactly where it is anatomically. I have an idea, but hasn't been uh, really uh, supported by any research. But I think we, yeah, I think easily we can treat people very effectively without root theory. Uh, I mean, taking someone like uh, Richard Schuster, who was uh, contemporary with Mert Root on the East Coast in New York at the New York College, he didn't use root theory, and he was supposedly one of the best clinicians with orthotics that uh, they had ever seen in that uh, area. So um, you, you don't need to use root theories in order to treat people effectively with orthotics, but I think it's good to know historically what he what Mert Root tried to say and what he was uh, trying to emphasize so you understand it in context with what we're doing now and how we've kind of moved past that. 
I agree. As I think there's a famous quote, if those who aren't aware of history are doomed to repeat it as well. So actually in that rhetorical uh, scenario, if you didn't teach it at some point in the future, someone might, would probably come along and say, you know, all of the same things again. Uh, Simon's just texted me saying it's Gary Morgan, Craig. It's Gary. You know, I, I, I have tried to contact him and track him down, but I uh, have not been able to make contact with him. I would like to because I, I, I keep quoting him. <laughs> well, let me, let, well, since we're talking so much, let me do a brief scenario. We were at a, it was in a lecturing in uh, the UK <laughs> and we uh, guy, this Gary Morgan comes up to me and says, Kevin, I want to tell you about my meat pie theory. He says that uh, he thought the root theory was very much like a meat pie, is that sometimes you get a meat pie filled with peas, sometimes you get it filled with pieces of meat, sometimes you get it filled with other, but in the end, you're still getting meat pie. And so he thought that the way we were taught to order orthotics were depending, no matter whether they had an Aquinas or they had an valgus or a Forfavaris, we're still balancing heel vertical with a four degree, four degree post with a... Uh, standard rear foot post uh, with an orthotic that ended at the metatarsal neck. So that was his analogy of a meat pie to uh, how uh, how we order orthotics under the root theory. That was, and he obviously told it much better than I did right now. But uh, there are, I think we did have quite a few discussions on that on both on um, could have been GISC mail and also on podiatry arena. But uh, we'll have to post up some of those links. Definitely. Um, let, let's talk a bit about uh, about the future because you've been around. You've been around. You obviously look the youngest of all three of us, Kevin. But you've been around uh, a few decades, so you've seen all of the changes. Let's talk about the, the future of podiatry. Firstly, point one: uh, Do you ever intend to retire? Are you just going to keep going till you drop? <laughs> well, that's um, unfortunately. Um, as I've gotten older and looked older, I have more and more patients. I get at least a patient a week now asking me when I'm going to retire. And I, <laughs> I, I generally say, well, you know something I don't know. Uh, so, um, you know, I, it's, it is kind of funny to me. I, I definitely, I've been in practice uh, for 32 and a half years. I'll be 61 in a few weeks. So uh, definitely uh, toward the end of my practice career, uh, I, you know, I, as long as I'm, my health is maintained, I'll probably still continue uh, treating patients uh, one way or another and trying to contribute. Uh, you know, as I've gotten older, though, the energy level obviously is not quite what it used to be. And um, But I'm doing a lot of lecturing still, which is fun, uh, seeing patients, which I still find for the most part fun. And, you know, I, I think what I would probably do instead of just totally retiring, which would probably drive my wife crazy, she, uh, I don't think she would want me <laughs> home all the time. Um, I, uh, I think what I'd probably do is just maybe cut back so I'm treating less and have more time to do. Uh, it'd be nice to be able to take some, like a month off and go teach at another, in another country at another school or you know, take a long vacation teaching uh, something like that. But uh, I, I think I'll probably continue going until I drop unless, you know, my health fails, but uh, hopefully that won't occur, but I'm going strong now. It's just not as much hair as I used to. And, uh, oh, please, please. That, that was, that was, a... yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but and then, you know it's fun I you know I w want to just one I want to add to that just a little bit and I often think of that because you know when you're getting in your 60s and you're uh, been in practice for 32 years you know what 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 draws you to the treatment and it's really you're making people better and I hate it sounds trite I guess but there's really you really can't re something for me uh, that you can't replace having people seeking you out and looking for you to help their pain and to improve their lives. And that, you know, and they are grat they're, they're gratified that you can help them and that you understand this maybe better than someone else. And they've been to other people and they find you and they're just very grateful. And I, I think that's, that's hard for a physician to replace that, that ability to have people seek you out, appreciate your expertise, and uh, you know, really appreciate that you've helped them out and uh, taken them out of pain. I think that's rather than you know, that's that's an important part of I think what I do, and uh, and also the and that's when I do writing, and I'm 
right now I'm uh, 10 newsletters away from my fifth newsletter book. So at the end of this year, I'll be doing the fifth newsletter book, a precision entry cast book. So, you know, I still enjoy the education. And again, I feel like the education for me is not so much for me. It's for, you know, when I'm not around anymore is to pass on what I've learned to other people who are younger than me and have an interest in the same topics I do so that they can learn. Uh, they don't have to go through the same process, the 30 some years of process of trying to get to where I am with my knowledge. So I think that's important to say uh, when we look at what we do as podiatrists and uh, what we, and why we do it. And um, even though we may not be the best paid we still enjoy doing it because it's helping people and we provide a service that other really no one else can provide. And moving forward, Kevin, into the future, you know, not just in podiatry, the, the whole, the whole world, we just, we advance in our understanding of, and our use of, of technologies and gasmo, gizmos and gadgets. And, you know, you're pretty, you're pretty sharp for a 60 year old. You, you Facebook, don't you? You, tw you, you tweet. <laughs> Uh, you know, you're, you're down. With, you're down. With, unless someone does it for you, do they? Or do you do it yourself? No, no I'm. I'm the geek here. So yeah. uh, <laughs> I, I don't think I, I, Craig. I think has got me beat by miles. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, you know, I, I do. I, you know, I, I, I like the the Facebook thing I do and the Twitter thing. It's nice to get. Uh, you know, it's a way for me to educate without. You know, podiatry arena was fun for a while, but you get bogged down by the people who just want to uh, bash you and make non-productive comments. So that gets a little, and we've covered about everything we could cover there for the most part. So I, this Facebook thing I'm doing now on the Twitter is away <laughs> from my sister. To, to <laughs> we, we, we talked about it with Emma Cowley um, before Christmas that, 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 that if we are going to try and educate the next generation of, of, of clinicians, this is where they go for their, for their information now so it's actually great i think that you know that people like you have embraced it uh, definitely um in your practice do you embrace technology in the same way what about things like you know the way we're going with laser scanning of feet over uh, potentially over plaster of paris and, and obviously in the future 3d printing uh, is that something you intend to embrace with equal uh, enthusiasm uh probably not um i you know I, I'm going to have to be convinced that a technology is going to improve my treatment before I use it. And I, um, and I'm not convinced that, you know, and also I'd have to relearn something that I've spent years getting good at. So, uh, and in my practice, I mean, things like oh, diagnostic ultrasound, I've often thought of having it, but you know, I just, I, I'm, I'm, I have three MRI places within a couple miles of me. And so it's almost easier for me just to send them to an MRI than to um, do the diagnostic ultrasound in my own office. So now I'm in a kind of a different practice setting. I'm practicing with an orthopedic surgeon and we have uh, only three treatment rooms. And, and so um, uh, the new technologies, I mean, uh, I don't really see anything in the new technology range that's going to really make me change the way I do I mean, we've done, uh, for example, one new technology I learned this a uh, few years ago was doing the planter plate repair from dorsal. That was fun, uh, you know, and I've done a few of those and had some pretty good results. Um, you know, we're doing, but really as far as uh, technology, like a uh, treadmill in the office, I don't do, I just do visual gate examinations. I think that when you've been practicing for 32 years and you've kind of got a system that works for you, you tend to stick with that. But if there was something that came along that I thought was worthwhile, both monetarily and also good for the patients, I would embrace it. But I, I don't see that I'm going to have to change things in my office too much to keep giving patients good treatment. Hmm. But, as, as far as the future, but as far as the future of podiatry, I, I think that what I worry, not so much in the UK and Australia and Spain and uh, the other countries, the United States is the problem is that the surgery has become such a fascination and emphasis for the profession that I, I, I fear that um, biomechanics and orthotics in the United States is uh, going to be probably done by another profession better um, within the next 20 years just because of the lack of emphasis. And that's, that's kind of sad for me to see, but at the same time, I, I, you can, one person can only do so much. And, um, but you know, I'm, I'm yeah, you know, people like you, Ian, and you're in the younger generation in the UK, and then we have 
uh, the, my colleagues and friends in Spain and Australia and, uh, and other countries that do a lot of research who are more year in your uh, era are, you know, they're very bright and uh, offering uh, me encouragement that what we've done here is not going to be forgotten and uh, when we are no longer around so that, uh, that uh, the uh, knowledge can continue to grow and uh, improvements can be made in therapies for our patients. Uh, I know we probably need to wrap up, Dewey Craig, just looking at the yeah, time. One, and more, stuff. one just, more question. One more. One more. Yeah. I just want to commend you, Kevin, on the beautiful organization of that bookshelf behind you. I, <laughs> this is the thing for me. And, uh, I, look at some people's book, I look at some people's bookshelves and they make, they make, they make me feel nauseous. It's just all, it, it's all height order. It's all just lovely. Um, what's your favorite? I, I presume they're all workbook. Uh, they're all textbooks. Uh, yeah, yeah. Books. Actually, I, I organized those for you, Ian. Uh, they were all very <laughs> messy and... Yeah. Out of, out of, they're all disheveled. But I said, okay, Ian is gonna Just really handle it. if he sees my bookshelf unorganized. I so I, I, I make um, sure that they're all lined up correctly for you. What's uh, what's your favorite book on in that in, entire collection there? Oh boy, that's you know I got uh, the top uh, top section is uh, a lot of sports and running shoe biomechanics. The second shelf on the this side is a lot of uh, biomechanics, uh, sports injuries, a lot of mechanical engineering, and uh, built like uh, uh, how do buildings stand up, et cetera. Then I have a surgery section over there. So it's, it really, I don't know the favorite book. Uh, you know, it's, I, I, do, I do really like um, R. McNeil Alexander's uh, books. Uh, we talked about that, I think, a little earlier. Um, mm. Anything animal biomechanics, you know, I was an animal physiology major during my undergraduate at the University of California, Davis, and uh, had a great course on uh, comparative vertebrate uh, uh, anatomy and relative to the biomechanics of, you know, why does a cheetah run so fast? Why is a gopher so good at digging? And, the, and that, those, uh, that is, those books, which emphasize the bipedal human relative to the rest of the quadrupeds and uh, and animals even like the marsupials and the kangaroos and wallabies that can hop uh, so efficiently on two feet. Um, those are those books are, are kind of fascinating to me. I, but I, I it would be hard to say those are my favorite books. But certainly books like that, I think, have always had a fascination to me, just because I think that um, we benefit as podiatrists understanding how other animals move so we can compare it to how humans move and uh, a lot of the same principles that are applied to animal locomotion apply to human locomotion awesome thank you craig anything else no i think that'd be a good spot to wind up on we'll be going almost 35 minutes i know kevin has to go and um go to work i have to go and wake my family up and get on with my holiday we're off fishing today <coughs> um, i'm gonna go to bed I appreciate I appreciate you guys having me on. I think this uh, pod chat live idea is uh, really a great idea for the profession. I commend you too for you know taking on this extra effort to do this sort of production because I you know I've enjoyed when you guys do it. Typically, I'm at the office uh, eating lunch and uh, I get to, it comes on at twelve typically my time, so I can watch. Uh, I enjoyed watching Emma and the others being interviewed because most of them I know and. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's great. I think it's a great way for podiatrists around the world and others to uh, see these people live, hear them talk live, and um, get some of their questions answered. So I think, think you guys are doing a great job here. All right. Thanks, thanks for, for coming on. Yeah. Look, for, for those that have joined late, this will be rendered by Facebook in probably about 20 minutes. The whole video will be there. I know I did promise this would be on YouTube, but I'm actually away on holiday at the moment. I haven't got my software here with me to put it on YouTube. So this video will be on YouTube next week, um, middle of the week. So I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll stop there. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, thanks, Ian. Thanks, Kevin. All right. Thanks a bunch, you guys.